Jedi do not fight for peace. That is only a slogan, and is as misleading as slogans always are. Jedi fight for civilization, because only civilization creates peace. We fight for justice, because justice is the fundamental bedrock of civilization. An unjust civilization is built upon sand. It does not long survive a storm. Tahiri. In the long term, it's easier to kill a powerful enemy than it is an apparently weak one. If you bring down a giant, you're a hero. If you kill something weak, even if it has to die, then you endure contempt. Being willing to be despised to serve the common good, that's the mark of a true Sith. You're going to make a fine apprentice for me, Tahiri. Mace Windu was a male Corrin roughly 53 years of age at the time of his death. Native to the mid-rim jungle world of Harun Kal, the Corrini were genetically human in almost every aspect. Their sole distinctive trait being that every single member of the species was born with the ability to call on the Force. While some Jedi anthropologists have speculated that the reason for this abnormality stemmed from the Koronai actually being descended from a group of Jedi that had crash-landed on the planet during the First Sith War, Mace himself has voiced a theory that his people's natural force use is, in reality, a survival adaptation. And when one considers the horrors that could be found in Harun Kal's jungles, it's not a very far-fetched thesis at all. Whatever the reasons for his powers may be, May still had the same basic biology as any other human, and therefore can be viewed as such. As noted by the Essential Guide to Alien Species, humans were a highly evolved race possessed of greatly evolved minds and advanced hardiness and adaptability to sudden environmental alterations. While these traits were by no means exclusive to them, they were still considered fairly extraordinary by the galactic standard, which allowed humans to become the most numerous and politically dominant species in the known galaxy, to the point where they were often considered to be the standard by which the biology, psychology, and even culture of other species were compared. Cool, I think. In terms of overall health, Master Windu maintained a tall and imposing figure throughout his entire life, no doubt the result of his continuous training and high-intensity missions. While his relatively advanced age means that his physical attributes are perhaps not quite as acute as they once were, the naturally sustaining power of the light side of the Force has clearly gone a long way to mitigate this. He may not be in his absolute prime, but he's far from decrepit. Moving into Force-enhanced strength, Mace was nothing less than a powerhouse. During the Battle of Dantooine, he was able to enhance his punches and kicks to the point where he could casually rend Super Battle Droids limb from limb. Super Battle Droids, I'd just like to remind everyone, being a type of droid made specifically to be able to take more damage than most other variants. Even more impressively, Mace has shown the ability to sustain blade locks with Council and even Grandmaster level beings like General Grievous, Count Dooku, Yoda, and Darth Sidious. While he was ultimately overpowered by Carv Vastor, a Koronai with only a limited degree of training, we mustn't forget that not only is Vastor's baseline physical strength significantly ahead of Mace's, but in terms of force connection, also represents some of the greatest raw power in the entire series, so it's really not that difficult to see why the Jedi Master was struggling. Speed-wise, Windu was, again, extraordinary. He had no trouble deflecting or outright evading blaster fire, and even his most casual lightsaber strikes have been directly compared to a bolt of lightning. During his duel with the Dark Lord, Mace is described along with Darth Sidious as moving so fast as to appear to be fading in and out of existence from the point of view of a distraught Anakin Skywalker. While some like to consider this to be an amped feat due to the nature of the Vopad effect, 
Windu has consistently shown the ability to match the swiftness of council and grandmaster level combatants without any sort of aid, most notably in his duels with Yoda and Count Dooku, the latter of whom we know for a fact can match Sidious's speed. This level of speed wasn't limited to lightsaber combat either, as he successfully landed six blows against Kar Vaster faster than the latter can see. For stamina, Mace was about as viable as anyone else of his caliber. Not only has he been frequently depicted taking part in prolonged battlefield engagements, but he has also shown the ability to hold down high-intensity lightsaber duels with top-tier combatants for incredibly long periods. Windu's durability was also highly impressive, his former student and fellow council master Deepa Balaba humorously claiming that he could take a beating as well as any man in the galaxy. Electrocution, blunt objects, flamethrower grazes, beatings from terrifying force giants, he's tanked them all. Easily his most impressive feat in this area was when he survived having a lightsaber tear through his abdomen after the aforementioned Deepa Balaba fell to the dark side. Moving into equipment, Mace Windu's loadout was… fairly typical. He has almost always been depicted wearing the robes of the Jedi Order, specifically the brown and tan variation that were the most common. While he would occasionally don a light chest plate and forearm gauntlets during his campaigns in the Clone Wars, he appears to have abandoned their use by the time of Revenge of the Sith. Additionally, Mace's character sheet in the Clone Wars Campaign Guide credits him with the Jedi Utility Belt, which carried a comlink, a rebreather, and sustenance capsules. Again, all very standard. The Jedi Master's most notable tool at the time of his death was, of course, his lightsaber, which was actually the second one he created in recognition of his position as a senior Jedi Council member. Though it followed the traditional single-bladed model without any sort of special mechanisms, the saber was specifically designed to emphasize precision and quality, its regal electrum finish only serving to enhance its prestige. The weapon was powered by a set of purple hurricane crystals that were gifted to Mace by the natives of Hurricane after he saved the life of one of the natives as a Padawan. While hurricane crystals were generally depicted as being just as powerful as more common variants, some sources have claimed that they produced blades that were especially good at penetrating an opponent's defenses, which, given Mace Windu's track record, makes a lot of sense. Darth Kytus was a human male and therefore possessed almost the exact same biological makeup as Mace Windu, the only real difference being that his Force sensitivity was an inherited trait from his mother, Leia Organa Solo, rather than a genetic predisposition shared by the entirety of his species. At 32 years of age, the Dark Lord was still well into his physical prime, his extensive combat training helping him to maintain the physique of a top-tier fighter. While continuous immersion in the dark side of the Force has been known to degrade one's physical capabilities and radically alter their appearance, Kytus, likely by the virtue of the fact that he was only a true Sith for a little over a year, had yet to suffer these effects, the only visible sign of his dark allegiance being his yellow eyes. That being said, he certainly wasn't without his handicaps. During the Second Battle of Nickel One, Kytus suffered a heavy blaster shot to the knee and had his left arm severed at the elbow by his twin sister Jedi Knight Jaina Solo, the resulting injuries forcing him to don a prosthetic kneecap and… actually, he never did anything about his missing arm since he didn't want to be laid up during a war. Okay. While the exact mechanics of his new knee have never been fully explained, it is my belief that it was likely just a more advanced version of the knee brace used by Jedi Master Thalm during the Clone Wars. And like with Thalm, it gave Kytus a pretty wicked knee strike. As for the Dark Lord's missing hand… Yeah, that definitely came with some disadvantages, as he was no longer able to employ two-handed strikes with his lightsaber, and could only fire off certain force abilities such as lightning with one hand. That being said, when discussing characters of Darth Kytus' level, missing one hand isn't quite as big of a deal as it is for others. Kytus, like virtually all noteworthy Jedi and Sith, was ambidextrous, meaning he could easily use either hand as the dominant one. 
Additionally, while this injury did have a minor effect on his martial technique, it didn't appear to impede his skill level in any significant way, as he was still able to contend with council-level Jaina during their final duel on the Anakin Solo. Addressing his application of Force-enhanced strength, Kytus doesn't have too many feats to his name, but the ones he does have are nothing less than extraordinary. During his battles with Mara Jade Skywalker, Kyle Katarn, and Jaina Solo, the Dark Lord was able to meet each of these High Council-level beings strength to strength without much issue, and even take an advantage at certain points. I would just like to remind everyone that Mara has successfully pushed back the cybernetically augmented Lumaya, Kyle has bested the hulking Chistori Dasan, and Jaina has casually kicked a Mandalorian Commando's best guard helmet hard enough to give the Mandalorian a concussion. This is in spite of the fact that Beskar is literally one of the most durable substances in the entire galaxy. Kytus' most impressive strength display, and you'll hear me say this a lot in this video, was during his final duel with Luke Skywalker above Kashyyyk. While he was unsuccessful at directly overpowering the Grand Master, he was able to hold his own for an extensive period of time and even very nearly choke Luke out with a Vong Tendril. Moving into speed, virtually everything I said in the strength section can be carried over since the Dark Lord appears to have maintained equal proficiency in both. Kytus had no trouble deflecting or evading blaster fire, and while he's never been directly depicted dodging force lightning from high-caliber practitioners, he does scale to or even above beings who have such as Mara and Jaina. Circling back to the Luke fight, while Kytus was clearly on the losing end of things, and while it could maybe be argued that the Grand Master was a bit hindered by his mental state at the time, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with 90% of arguably the strongest Jedi in history and not getting instantly speed blitzed is far from an anti-feat. For stamina, Darth Kytus was extremely viable. Like Windu, he has been frequently depicted taking part in prolonged battlefield engagements, specifically the Yuzhan Vong War, and has also shown the ability to hold down high-intensity lightsaber duels with top-tier combatants for incredibly long periods. Next we have durability, and this is where things get really insane. Now, I know this might sound like blasphemy to some, but setting aside cybernetically augmented beings like Darth Vader or Lumaya, it is my belief that Darth Kytus has the highest natural combat durability among the Rule of Two Sith. And yes, I say that while being fully aware of what Darth's Bane, Plagueis, and Maul can endure. What I mean by that is while I don't necessarily think his inborn durability is that much higher than other Sith of his caliber, his capacity for understanding and dealing with pain in the heat of combat is what puts him ahead. After being captured by the Yuzhan Vong during the mid-stages of the war, Kytus, then known as Jason Solo, was subjected to the Embrace of Pain, an organic torture device invented by the species. Within its coils, Kytus discovered a new definition of pain and suffering, as the device literally read the electrochemical outputs of his nerve impulses in order to inflict a customized agony that operated at both constant and optimum levels. While most sentients couldn't survive the embrace for more than a few minutes, Kytus held out for weeks and in that time, he instinctively developed the ability to endure and focus through pain that even top-tier Jedi couldn't even hope to withstand. This tolerance became even more pronounced when he became a Sith Lord, as he would use his pain to strengthen his connection to the dark side, turning him into a violent machine of battle that few could even hope to stand against. Moving into equipment, Darth Kytus was virtually the polar opposite of Mace Windu in both dress and armament. In keeping with Sith tradition, he favored customized black robes complete with boots, gloves, and a snazzy cape to announce his authority. Kytus also wore a set of light GHE dark armor, its most prominent features being a segmented chest piece, shoulder pauldrons, and shin guards. While the armor's exact makeup has never been fully flushed out, 
it can be assumed that it was fairly ordinary by galactic military standards. As while it could easily repel conventional blunt and stabbing weapons, it possessed no special resistance to heavy blasters or lightsabers. Shifting into Kaidus' weaponry, I want to make it clear that while it is true that the Dark Lord was killed fighting with only his lightsaber, I am operating under the assumption that the Dark Lord is outfitted with all of his killing tools for this particular matchup. The reasons for this are actually fairly obvious. The use of multiple weapons has always been an integral part of Kaidus' personal fighting style, and he has been depicted utilizing them in virtually every single fight he's been in, barring his last one. Who knows, maybe I'll do a crossover match with him in 1010 one day. Actually, that would be a pretty massive stomp, so maybe not. Starting from common to exotic, Kaidus frequently carried a fully loaded blaster pistol. Likely of GHE standard issue, the weapon possessed all of the physical characteristics of a military-grade pistol, with a presumed 50 shots per round capacity. Getting more personal, Kaidus also carried a vibroblade, which was basically a large knife outfitted with ultrasonic vibration technology to increase its cutting effectiveness. While some ne'er-do-wells have been known to outfit their vibroblades with cortosis weave in order to enable them to parry lightsabers, there is no indication that the Dark Lord's personal shiv possessed such tech, though it would admittedly make sense given his choice of career. Perhaps the Dark Lord's most devious weapon was the small blowgun housed in his gauntlet that contained a set of poison darts. While we, again, know very little about the exact mechanics of this weapon, it was noted that the darts were similar to the ones employed by the Dark Jedi Alima Rar, which means that they were more than likely doused in the poison of the Washaber insect of Tenupe, which itself was almost impossible to repel since the rare poison literally turned the immune system of a target against their own body. Last but not least, we have Darth Kaidus' lightsaber, which was the second one he created after joining the Sith. While the saber's design has been a bit inconsistent across various depictions, the most commonly accepted configuration was that of a single-bladed model with silver plating, a long handle, and no special mechanisms. The weapon was powered by a set of red crystals, and while it is unknown as to whether or not these gems were natural or synthetic, I'm more inclined to believe that they were synthetic given the limitations with which Kaidus was working under during assembly. Often referred to as Sith-style crystals, lightsaber gems infused with the power of the dark side often produced energy blades with greater cutting power than the ones employed by the Jedi. And while the phenomenon was extremely rare, Sith sabers even had the potential to break the blade of standard lightsabers by overloading the energy matrix and instantly burning it out. Though, again, I must stress this almost never happened. As I've said before, aside from their respective force powers manifesting for different reasons, there are no significant biological variations between Mace Windu and Darth Kaidus. Both are humans in every aspect that actually matters, and as such, this verdict will hinge on health, athletic feats, and the benefits of their equipment rather than anatomical makeup. Starting with their level of fitness, the two actually create an interesting contrast. Both are prodigious martial artists who have maintained incredible physiques throughout their entire lives, yet neither is without their limitations. Mace is 21 years older than Kaidus, and while that would normally cause a rather noticeable differential in their physical outputs, even for beings of their caliber, it is the Jedi Master here who ironically suffers from fewer baseline debilitations, most notably in his lack of any dark side degradation and missing limbs. That being said, I still don't think the actual significance of Darth Kaidus' handicaps is all that great. While we have seen that heavy dark side channeling can eventually erode one's body over and above what the Force can compensate for, Kaidus simply wasn't alive long enough to reach that state, and what little decay he did display didn't seem to affect him at all. 
Similarly, while missing an arm would certainly be an issue for a normal person, we mustn't forget that we're not talking about normal people. We are talking about ultra-powerful space wizards who operate well beyond what any of us can even begin to fathom. So the same rules don't apply. I'm not denying that Kytus' missing arm does hinder him, I just believe it's not as big of a deal as many would initially presume. And as such, while Mace probably gets the health edge on paper, when factoring in Kytus' youth and ability to compensate for his handicaps, the factors generally balance out. Moving into strength, I'd say they're roughly on par. Both have been shown bolstering themselves well beyond the standards of their respective orders, and both have displayed a similar performance level. Mace has admittedly been shown being overpowered more times than Kytus has, but we mustn't forget that each of those times he has either been pre-prime, injured beforehand, or pitted against an opponent that exceeds the Dark Lord in raw strength. Kytus is strong, but he's no Carvastor. A similar situation is at play with their respective levels of speed. You have one who is able to match and ultimately overcome the speed of Darth Sidious, and one who is able to somewhat keep pace with Grandmaster Luke Skywalker. As I've said before, while some like to consider Mace's performance in Revenge of the Sith to be an amped feat, that Again, doesn't really matter here because not only has the Jedi Master displayed comparable levels of speed without any sort of amp, but when you consider the inherent nature of Vopad, even if you were to argue that Kytus is a little bit faster than baseline Mace, he's going to be able to at least match him for the duration of the fight no matter what happens. So, there you go. Stamina is, again, basically the same circumstance. Both have shown the ability to wage marathon fights on the battlefield and in single combat, and both have repeatedly kept their composure when faced with council and even grandmaster level adepts. While it can certainly be argued that due to Kytus' age that he would eventually win out in a pure war of attrition against Mace, but again, the gap between them is so small and the Vopad effect helps so much that it still just peters out at the end of the day. Comparing their levels of durability, however, is a much different story. Mace Windu is a freaking tank, and when ranked against most other human Sith Lords, he can either surpass their endurance at best or match them at worst. Unfortunately for him, Darth Kytus is far from an ordinary human Sith Lord. Not only has the Dark Lord been subjected to just about everything the Jedi Master has been shown dealing with, he surpasses him in how he handles them. Thanks to the embrace of pain, that's a weird phrase, Kytus has reached arguably the apex of what a human force sensitive of his level can endure without any sort of cyborg support. It's not just his ability to take hits, though that is pretty fucking insane, but also his ability to focus through pain and use it to fuel his combative output. While I don't doubt that Mace could endure the embrace much longer than most Jedi if he was subjected to it, he simply hasn't done anything to suggest that he would last and thrive in it the same way Kytus did. Especially when we consider that feeding off pain is inherently antithetical to Jedi doctrine. Yeah, you could argue that Mace could enter the Vopad state of mind to channel his pain into him and out again, but Vopad has never been directly used in that way, and to assume that it could goes a bit too deep into the realm of speculation even for me. As such, from where I'm standing right now, Mace simply cannot take the same degree of punishment that Kytus can. Things don't get any better for the Jedi Master when we consider their respective gear. While there is of course no difference between their cloaks aside from cosmetics, Darth Kytus' armor gives him a margin for error that Mace simply lacks. Yeah, the armor hasn't shown any resistance to lightsabers, but some protection is still better than none. And if that suit can take a direct physical strike from Jaina Solo and Luke Skywalker, it can definitely take one from Windu. While both combatants wield standard single-bladed lightsabers, Kytus's boasts slightly greater cutting power due to its Sith crystals, as well as the extremely rare possibility of breaking Mace's saber during prolonged battle. 
Further cementing the Dark Lord's edge is the fact that he has access to an entire arsenal of distinct weapons, whereas the Jedi Master is limited to basically just his saber. Blaster pistols, vibroblades, and poison darts may not be that useful against high-caliber Jedi when wielded by a normie, but in the hands of a powerful Sith Lord, they become something truly terrifying. Not only do these weapons give Kaidus something to fall back on should he be bereft of his lightsaber, but, more to the point, they give him significantly more options in combat. Like a well-trained army commando, he can alternate between various tools to confuse his opponents. He has threatened Jedi semi-comparable to Mace Windu with these weapons. He has killed Jedi semi-comparable to Mace Windu with these weapons. So it's not like there's no precedence for their viability. At the end of the day, while Mace Windu's and Darth Kytus's physical and tool-based stats stand at something of a deadlock, Kytus' youth, combined with his greater durability and wide array of deadly weapons, pushes the contest ever so slightly in his favor. And in a battle with characters of this level, slightly can be as impactful as a Death Star laser. I award Darth Kytus the edge in physical capability and equipment. In his writings in the Jedi Path, famed Jedi ace Crick Sunburst described those who followed the path of the Jedi Guardian as being the Republic's first and most crucial line of defense against those who seek to destroy it. Dedicating themselves to the protection of the innocent, Guardians spent almost all of their free time honing their martial arts skills and developing new techniques to combat evil. And while every Jedi who has walked this path over the centuries has done their part to live up to these ideals, few have embodied them as completely and utterly as Mace Windu. While compassionate, he is first and foremost a warrior, and unlike many of his brethren, has never hesitated to cut loose when the situation called for it. As noted by many sources, and I mean many sources, Mace was one of the greatest blades beings the old Jedi Order had ever produced in its 25,000 year history. Addressing his era specifically, Windu was widely considered to be second only to Grand Master Yoda in terms of martial skill. Though it is worth noting that some sources have at least somewhat implied that the Korin was THE greatest warrior of his age, bar none. I know that might sound like a bit of a contradiction, but I always interpreted it as Mace not so much exceeding Yoda in raw martial knowledge, but more so being his superior in adopting a battle mindset. Remember, Yoda, for all his skill, doesn't actually enjoy fighting while Mace does. Even if we ignore those contradicting sources, Yoda has praised Windu's skill time and again, and has even gone as far as to state that he was the only living Jedi besides himself who could match Count Dooku on even ground. At least at that point in time. Shifting in defeats, Mace has fought hundreds of the universe's most deadly warriors, besting opponents from both the Jedi and Sith Orders. During a misunderstanding on Coruscant and a spar on Lyanna, Windu fought Jedi Master Quinlan Voss, and both times bested him with little to no difficulty. While the concept of a Jedi Council Master defeating a regular Jedi Master isn't exactly groundbreaking, it should be stressed that Voss was easily one of the strongest non-Council Jedi of his day having bested powerful beings like Kakruk and Ayla Sakura, and even gaining the notice of the Sith, so it's not like fighting him is a walk in the park for most people. Jumping ahead to the Clone Wars, Mace engaged almost every single major antagonist of the conflict. His first major fight was against the former Jedi Swordmaster turned CIS defector Sora Bulk, who is confirmed to not only be one of the greatest saber instructors of his day, but the co-developer of the Corrin Master's personal fighting style. While the initial fight was fairly even, Mace ultimately proved to be the superior fighter, stunning Bulk with a force blast 
and disengaging in order to save his allies from Asajj Ventress. Speaking of the ruthless Radataki, Windu's next notable feat came literally minutes later when he fought Ventress and forced her to flee. While it is true that the official Star Wars fact file states that the Jedi Master needed to use all of his skills in order to defeat Ventress, we mustn't forget that this took place directly after the bulk fight, so Mace more than likely wasn't operating at maximum capacity, but more to the point, I still don't see this statement as being a big deal. Keep in mind that this was classic Asajj Ventress, not the insultingly underpowered version depicted in TCW. In the proper continuity, Asajj was capable of besting Kit freaking Fisto and very nearly defeating Anakin Skywalker, so a tired mace needing to go all out to beat her is not an anti-feat. Several months later on his birth world of Harun Kal, Windu would face his most emotionally trying fight when he was forced to cross blades with his former apprentice and fellow council master Deepa Balaba after she went insane from prolonged exposure to the planet's dark side aura. Even before her fall to the dark side, Deepa was considered to be one of the strongest swordswomen of the council, even managing to outshine her master on a few select occasions. While a fight with her under normal circumstances would be a planet-moving effort, I'd also like to point out that Mace went into this fight with several unfavorable circumstances, not the least of which being his stated emotional instability at the prospect of fighting basically his daughter, as well as the giant fucking hole in his stomach that the crazed Deepa had inflicted on him in a surprise attack. Despite all this, the Corrin Master was able to match her for an exceedingly long period of time, and although Nick Rostu's interference meant that he didn't technically win in the traditional sense, the fact that he was doing as well as he did despite being so heavily nerfed leads me to believe that all things being equal, he would be able to defeat her, even if only barely. Moving into the final months of the war, Mace Windu would go blade to blade with the powerful Sith Lord Count Dooku during the Battle of Ba's Pity. While the fight was admittedly brief, Mace matched the Count blow for blow relatively comfortably, lending credence to Yoda's aforementioned speculations, and was more than likely on the verge of taking the advantage given the fact that Dooku opted to use his Magna Guards as a distraction in order to allow him to retreat. Weeks later, Mace would face off against the CIS commander General Grievous atop a moving maglev train during the Battle of Coruscant. Once again, the duel was, at least in a purely martial sense, fairly even. Mace definitely had the initial edge, however Grievous's advanced cybernetic brain eventually allowed him to adapt to and even somewhat mimic the Jedi Master's fighting style. Realizing things could go on forever if left unchecked, Mace knocked Grievous off the train with a powerful force blast, ending the fight. This is extremely impressive, because just as with Ventress, we are talking about classic General Grievous, not this fucking thing. Grievous has repeatedly schooled multiple council-level beings, including Ventress, and Dooku himself considered him a serious challenge. So, again, this is not something to just brush over. Last but not least, we have both Mace Windu's most impressive feat and his most controversial one. During the events of Revenge of the Sith, Mace dueled the reigning Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious, and after a disgustingly hard-fought battle, emerged victorious. However, due to Anakin Skywalker's betrayal, Mace was ultimately unable to finish Sidious off and was killed. Now then, there are several factors we need to acknowledge. First off, in terms of just pure martial skill, Mace is at the very least equal to Sidious, if not superior. Mace scales to, or nearly to Yoda, and Yoda was able to successfully disarm Sidious in their duel. Secondly, Sidious' biggest advantage in this fight was his greater force power, not his saber skills. If they were, things would have gone much differently. 
Thirdly, it is due to the nature of Vapad that Mace was able to counter Sidious' force power by looping it around back at him, which was then broken when the Jedi Master employed his Shatterpoint ability, so it was not a purely martial victory. All that being said, does it really matter? All Vapad did was put Mace on equal footing with Sidious in terms of force channeling. It's not like it made him a better martial artist. The Force doesn't work that way. If Mace had been an inherently inferior duelist than Sidious, he would have been killed regardless of the amp, but he wasn't. And therefore, not only did Mace win the fight, he proved himself to be at least the Dark Lord's equal with the blade, which is beyond incredible when you consider what Darth Sidious has done and been credited with. Also, George Lucas stated that Mace is capable of standing up to Sidious, so I win. Moving into technique and attributes, Mace Windu was a fighter in every sense of the word, possessing a broad skill set that was cultivated through decades of combat training and experience. As noted by multiple sources, Windu was a master of all seven forms of classical lightsaber combat, no mean feat in itself. However, his primary martial arts discipline was actually a style of his own creation, the form known as Vapad. Presumably developed during the Korin's early years, Vapad was a variation of Form 7, Juyo, which was commonly regarded as the most dangerous of the Jedi styles due to the extreme internal focus needed to use it properly. As noted by the Revenge of the Sith novelization, Mace created Vapad specifically to answer his greatest weakness, that being his intrinsic enjoyment of a fight. By opening oneself to the Force, Vapad essentially allows an ideal user to transform his or her inner darkness into a more positive expression of Jedi philosophy, channeling the shadows, but not letting it touch them. While the style did have several stances and maneuvers all its own, Vapad shared much of its core technique with Juyo, mainly in its use of bold sweeping power blows and direct calculated stabs. Vapad's most notable feature, however, was known as the superconducting loop effect. When fighting a dark opponent, be they Sith or otherwise, a Vapad master can essentially feed off their rage and use it to amplify themselves without succumbing to it. This in turn creates a circuit with one half being the Vapad master's channeling and the other half being the power of darkness inherent to the opponent, which just then kinda keeps going until one of them dies. While you don't really hear much of this these days, some fans back in the day liked to argue that the concept of the superconducting loop effect was just a theory that was completely unproven until the Sidious fight. However, this belief is entirely untrue, as during the first year of the Clone Wars, Mace recorded a message for both Kiadi Mundi and Egan Kolar detailing the specifics of his creation as well as the mechanics of the superconducting loop, meaning that the Jedi Master was aware of the effect well before Revenge of the Sith. Shifting into his actual means of battle, Mace Windu's offensive technique embodied the concept of controlled lethality. He held nothing back when attacking his foes, yet always struck with precision and grace. While he would often use whichever form suited the needs of the moment, when going full Vapad mode, his sequences consisted of relentless, unpredictable slashes and cleaves that have been equated to shots from an auto blaster. The Jedi Master heavily reinforced these moves with integrated physical combat and force abilities, having a particular fondness for grapples, jabs, telekinesis, and shatterpoint. Mace could also defend just as capably as he could destroy. When confronted by shooters, he would utilize a set of whipping swipes no doubt derived from Xi'an to redirect bolts back at the shooters, and when confronted by other trained lightsaber duelists, he would employ the tenets of either Sarisu or Dejem So by keeping his blade close to his body and using blade binding techniques to intercept oncoming strikes, which were then often followed up by immediate offensive counters. Unsurprisingly, for a man who has spent his entire life in the pursuit of martial and diplomatic excellence, Mace Windu was a highly skilled tactician. During the Clone Wars, Mace served as one of only 10 Jedi High Generals in the Grand Army of the Republic, which is actually the highest military rank a Jedi can achieve. 
Over the course of the conflict, Windu led his troops to victory on numerous key worlds. His quick thinking and general comfort in combat gelling surprisingly well with those of his clone troopers despite the Jedi Master's noted distrust of them. That being said, just because one is comfortable in combat doesn't mean they can't be outmaneuvered. Despite his stern disposition, Windu actually held a deep love for the friends he's made in his travels and his fellow Jedi, particularly those he's trained with. While by no means a bad thing, this love has unfortunately been used against him on several occasions. This was most clearly demonstrated in his interactions with Deepa Balaba during the events of the Shatterpoint novel. Mace loved Deepa like a daughter, and it was because of this love that he was unable to fully comprehend her descent into darkness before it was too late. When Deepa finally fell, she faked unconsciousness and nearly killed Mace with a saber to the gut. Why did this work? Because she knew he would trust her. Granted, Mace does learn from this experience and later made efforts to better control his emotions, but I honestly have a hard time believing he ever truly extinguished this weakness. Circling back to battle, when engaged in either group or one-on-one -on -one combat, Mace typically followed what was known as the rapier mindset. Though ill-defined at best, this tactic seemed to involve sussing out the chink in an opponent's armor, then striking it with maximum force. Whether that be blinding a giant killer droid by slashing at the weaker armor around its eyes, or stunning a hulking dark side behemoth by nerve punching his arms. My personal favorite display of this tactical method was during Mace's final duel with Darth Sidious. Sensing that the Vopad effect could cause the fight to last forever, the Jedi Master shattered a nearby window and then proceeded to lure the Dark Lord onto the ledge. This forced Sidious to reallocate some of his energies away from his force-enhanced speed into a force-enhanced grip on the ledge, which caused him to hesitate for a brief moment. Taking advantage of this hesitation, Mace slashed Sidious's lightsaber in two, forcing the Sith Lord to his knees. Clean and efficient. As I mentioned previously, Jedi Guardians spent the majority of their spare time honing their martial arts techniques with the explicit intent to combat evil, which made them, generally, the most skilled physical combatants of the Jedi Order. However, this specialization was not without its handicaps. Guardians may have been able to swing a saber better than anyone else, but when it came to their general understanding of and ability to call on the Force to aid them in battle, they were often almost painfully pedestrian. Fortunately, like every great weakness, there have been those who have successfully risen above it. As the Sith Blade Master Kasim explained in the novel Darth Bane Path of Destruction, when true Jedi and Sith engage in combat, it is ultimately the Force that is the key to victory. One of the reasons beings like Obi-Wan Kenobi, Mace Windu, and Darth Vader were so strong was because they were among the few within the Guardian branch who recognized its limitations and worked towards balancing out their martial predispositions with a deep spiritual understanding. Darth Kytus was also one of those beings. While the Force was always his primary focus, he did not let this preference come at the detriment of his connection to the physical realm. He was not a Sith warrior. He was not a Sith warlock. He was a true Sith master. Darth Kytus was an exceptional martial artist. His deep hunger for knowledge and extensive combat experience crafting him into one of the biggest death machines to ever terrorize the universe. In regards to accolades, Kytus considered himself to be the best swordsman of both his and all eras of Jedi and Sith history, with the only possible exception being Grand Master Luke Skywalker himself. While we must of course always take the boasting of a Sith Lord with a grain of salt, considering the fact that the only duelists that have ever been depicted taking the advantage against Kytus in a lightsaber duel were Jaina Solo, the Sword of the Jedi, and, well, Grandmaster Luke Skywalker, I think it goes without saying that even if he wasn't their definitive superior, he was definitely on their level. 
Shifting into feats, Darth Kytus' reign, like his grandfather before him, elapsed during one of the most devastating periods in galactic history. And as the ruler of the New Empire, he was forced to do battle with many of the top-tier force wielders of the era. During the Battle of Kashyyyk, Kytus fought Ben Skywalker and defeated him with little difficulty despite the young Jedi Knight having the element of surprise. While many like to write off this feat, since Ben was nowhere near as strong as he would later become during the Fate of the Jedi series, which even then was not comparable to Kytus, I personally think there's quite a bit to appreciate. First off, while it is true that Ben wasn't even within running distance of his stated force potential, it would still be quite a lowball to assume he was just your average Jedi Knight at the time. Don't forget that this is the same Ben who just a few months later would hold his own against Tahiri Vela, who's not exactly a neophyte. Secondly, Ben had the element of surprise, yet Kytus was able to perceive and outmaneuver his assassination attempt, which says a lot about the Sith Lord's tactical prowess, which we'll cover more later. Lastly, it was this fight that solidified Kytus' decision to try and take Ben on as his Sith apprentice which he wouldn't have done if the Skywalker had been weak. Jumping back in time a few months, Kytus would face a much more experienced and deadly assassin in the form of the infamous Jedi hunter Ara Singh after a brutal battle aboard his flagship. Now then, this feat is both extremely impressive and extremely controversial, mainly due to the level of difficulty Kytus displayed accomplishing it. While Ara Singh is very strong, easily more so than Ben was at this point, she's never been one of the absolute best fighters of all time. Yes, she defeated the famed Jedi Master Sherad Het, who we know for a fact is council level, but he was injured and exhausted at the time, and when pitted against a similarly strong Ayla Sakura during the Clone Wars, she lost. So, why did Kytus struggle at all to put Aura down? Logistics. During the fight, the novel makes it pretty clear that Kytus was prioritizing the safety of his daughter Alana, who was in the room at the time, as well as his love for said daughter severely compromising his ability to call on the dark side of the Force. This actually makes the feat far more impressive in my opinion, since we have Kytus getting the better of a Jedi Master level combatant while operating under a severe handicap. This would not be Darth Kytus' last battle with a powerful woman, as his next major brawl would be with the Jedi Council Master Mara Jade Skywalker within the Caves of Kavan. As I think many of you know by now, Mara at this stage in her career was well beyond your average Council levels. And while she wasn't necessarily regarded as the strongest fighter of her day, many of the other Masters did consider her the most well-rounded fighter of her day, which is pretty hefty praise given who she's sharing seats with. Now, while I'm no fan of excess violence, this brutal fight is actually one of my favorite duels in the entire Star Wars franchise. Rather than just statically pounding at each other, Kytus and Mara go beast mode, pulling out every technique with every weapon in every way they can, and it is glorious. While the two were fairly evenly matched in the beginning stages of the fight, Kytus ultimately proved himself to be the better, matching his aunt's unorthodox fighting style with his own and leveraging his superior power in the Force to his advantage, distracting Mara with an illusion of Ben and giving him time to ram a poison dart into her leg, killing her. Moving ahead a few months, Darth Kytus would defeat the renowned Jedi Battlemaster Kyle Katarn and his small Jedi squad in the Undercity district of Coruscant. Now, again, this is another feat with various parameters. As I've stated in numerous past videos, Kyle Katarn was one of the greatest swordmasters of his era, having bested numerous council-level beings before even reaching his prime. In regards to the rest of the squad, well, Kytus himself admits that none of them would be a match for him either separately or collectively, but there is always strength in numbers. Another factor to consider was Kytus' physical condition, as he had yet to fully recover from his fight with Luke before the Jedi ambushed him. Despite all these supposed handicaps, Darth Kytus conducted himself extremely well, playing his four opponents against each other Zana-style. 
When the Dark Lord and the Battlemaster finally squared off one-on-one, -on -one, the fight was fairly equal, the complete Star Wars encyclopedia stating outright that it was taxing for both of them. That being said, crossing blades with arguably the strongest Jedi Battlemaster ever while you're a bit injured and not getting completely obliterated is nothing to thumb your nose at. This was shown even more clearly when Kytus ended the duel by faking Katarn out with a false force push, then proceeding to pull a speeder into the Jedi's back, launching him chest first onto his blade. A cheater's win? Yeah, but Sith. Jumping ahead one year, Darth Kytus would face off against his twin sister, Jedi Knight Jaina Solo. Their first duel taking place above Nickel One, and their second duel aboard the Anakin Solo. All throughout her life, Jaina has consistently been portrayed as matching and in some cases even exceeding her brother in raw swordsmanship, and after her training with Boba Fett, she developed new skills that the Sith Lord had never encountered. Addressing the Nickel One duel, um, Jaina won. There's really no two ways about it. She held the dominant position almost the entire time and was the less injured of the two by the end of it. That being said, the novel makes it pretty clear that this victory came about mainly through Luke Skywalker amping Jaina with his battle meditation ability rather than her innate skill and power. Darth Kytus' second fight with Jaina was far more even, the two of them going blow for blow the entire time, and it can be argued that Kytus resigned from the fight and allowed himself to be killed in order to save his family. Basically what I'm saying here is when you look at it objectively, Darth Kytus is at worst equal to Jaina in saber skills and at best can be argued to be slightly above her, at least at that point in time. Fate of the Jedi Jaina is an entirely different story and I'll explore that more in my next matchup. Ooh, did I just let that slip? Whoops. Last but not least, we have Darth Kytus' highest and arguably most famous feat. During the aforementioned Battle of Kashyyyk, Kytus dueled Grand Master Luke Skywalker, and although the Sith Lord put up an absolutely brutal fight, he was ultimately unable to defeat his uncle, only gaining the advantage when Luke was distracted by Ben's peril. Now, like with Mace v Sidious, this fight does have a few logistical factors surrounding it, though not nearly to the same degree. Kytus fought well, but he was not Luke's equal with the blade. This is particularly poignant when we consider the fact that the Sith Lord technically had home field advantage given that the duel took place in his personal torture chamber. I've heard some argue that Kytus got stronger between this fight and his final one with Jaina, and while I'm willing to accept that, we must not forget that Luke looked into various futures during the time frame of the Jaina fight to see what would happen if he had been the one charged to take the Sith Lord down, and he stated outright that in every instance, he still won. The only factor holding him back being that he was afraid that he would give in to anger since Kytus was the one responsible for killing Mara. Taking all that into account, I think it's safe to say that while they are indeed close, Kytus is not Luke's equal with the blade. Though, if your cap is arguably the strongest Jedi in the franchise, you're not exactly a pushover. Moving into technique and attributes, Darth Kytus, as mentioned, was a spiritualist, yet still maintained a strong martial focus, mastering a wide variety of disciplines from his various teachers. While the Sith Lord's exact martial discipline is not confirmed in any source, he was noted to have mastered all of the tenets taught at Luke's Yavin 4 Jedi Academy at the time of his enrollment, which leads me to believe that his primary specialization was the Three Rings of Defense. Essentially a hybrid of the strong, medium, and fast styles featured in the Dark Forces series, the Three Rings of Defense was a simplistic tutorial style designed to introduce the students of the Jedi Academy to the principles of lightsaber combat. The main difference obviously being that it functioned as a multi-layered singular style rather than three separate ones. 
As the Jedi Master Corrin Horn described in the novel I, Jedi, the form consisted of three sets of unique stances and maneuvers that dealt with dueling at various ranges. The outer ring consisting of grand sweeping power attacks, the middle ring rapid short strikes used to intercept projectiles, and the inner ring tight conservative blocks used to shunt aside and repost against an enemy's attacks. Although this is, again, unconfirmed, I am also of the opinion that Kytus held a deep understanding, if not outright mastery, of all seven classical lightsaber forms as well. Not only is the Sith Lord implied to have instructed Ben in the basics of Shi Cho, but, more to the point, he has consistently held his own and adapted to the fighting styles of Jedi who have confirmed mastery of most or even all of the forms, which implies at least a strong academic understanding. Addressing his actual methodology, I would describe Darth Kytus' offensive technique as being something akin to that of a hypothetical Sith Commando. Just as a well-trained soldier will break out whatever tool is necessary to accomplish their mission, Kytus adopts whatever fighting style is necessary to kill his opponents. One second he could be engaging you in a saber lock, and in the next he could break away, zip off to the left, draw his pistol, and shoot you in the face. The sort of unorthodox style made him dangerously unpredictable, particularly when one considers his extensive combat experience. As far as his pure saber attacks went, Kytus clearly held preference for the middle ring, as his assaults were often described as consisting of lightning-fast slashes, yet with little to no overextension. The Sith Lord heavily reinforced these sequences with integrated physical combat and force abilities, having a particular fondness for targeted punches, telekinesis, and lightning. Shifting over to defense, Darth Kytus' personal style clearly owed much to the sequences of the inner ring and possibly Sarisu. When engaging shooters, even those as skilled as the Mandalorians, he would bat away bolts as though they were a nuisance, and when engaging other duelists, he relied on tight conservative parries to shunt aside incoming strikes, while a precise shifting of weight and stance enabled the facilitation of deft evasions. During his duel with Luke Skywalker, while Kytus was unable to block all of the Grand Master's strikes, he was able to deflect many of his probing assaults, which is pretty impressive considering the core of Luke's style was to gem so, which is widely known for its ability to overwhelm guards. As is almost always the case with a reigning Rule of Two Sith Master, Darth Kytus was a highly adept tactician. During the Second Galactic Civil War, Kytus held the title of Joint Chief of State and Head Military Commander. Over the course of the conflict, Kytus led his forces to victory on numerous key worlds, his intuitive thinking and utter ruthlessness allowing him to crush nearly all opposition that opposed him. However, when it came to more personal thinking, Kytus was… unique among the Sith to say the least. Believing himself to be the only one capable of bringing peace to the galaxy, he increasingly sought to control his environment, becoming uncomfortable when he was not in charge of his actions, feelings, and surroundings. This may sound like general edginess, but believe me, it gets much worse. Like Windu, Kytus held a deep love for the beings around him, though whereas the Jedi Master's love was centered in a genuine desire to protect people, Kytus sought to control them. He believed that by melding the concept of love with Sith philosophy, he could create a utopian society across the universe where every being of every species cared for each other, yet was still governed by his iron will, since, in his mind, he was the only one capable of making the right decisions for everyone. Yeah, he's totally not insane. Not at all. No, but in all seriousness, he's actually a lot like Darth Treya. You're not actually supposed to buy into what he's selling, he just dresses it up in a bunch of big words so you don't notice the utter BS it really is. Circling back to combat, Darth Kytus, while he did have a slight tendency to panic and let his emotions get the better of him, was still a living Swiss army knife. He would analyze his opponents and adopt whatever technique or weapon best suited the nature of the fight, then spam the living hell out of it. This includes both personal and environmental factors, as seen by his duel with Kyle Katarn. 
Darth Kytus was also quite adept at employing the Sith tactic of Dune Moke, using verbal taunts and terrifying displays of power to rattle his foes and keep them from bringing their full power to bear. I suppose Grandpa would be proud. Depending, of course, on when you asked him. This conclusion is a tricky one. While their respective dedication to the art couldn't be more different even if they made an active effort to do so, Mace Windu and Darth Kytus were both extremely powerful and varied martial artists, generally recognized as second only to the absolute apexes of their eras. Starting with a comparison of their feats, the two are actually very similar. In a broad sense, both have faced opposition from a wide variety of highly skilled opponents, both light and dark, who utilized various different skill configurations and tactics. Getting more centered, the level of danger presented by their respective foes is, again, fairly even. Classic Asajj Ventress is easily comparable to Mara Jade Skywalker in Raw Saber skill, Count Dooku and Kal Katarn's attributes are so similar they might as well be the same character, and I think it goes without saying that Classic General Grievous and Jaina Solo are at the very least on the same tier when it comes to blade work. Honestly, the real meat of this section comes through comparing their highest end showings. You have one fighter who is capable of matching and ultimately defeating Darth Sidious, and another who was capable of matching but was ultimately defeated by Luke Skywalker. On paper, this sounds like a pretty clear-cut win for Kytus, since we know for a fact that Luke is capable of beating Sidious in a lightsaber duel, but the equation is not that simple. Firstly, do not forget that as likely as it is that Mace and Sidious are equals, it is just as likely that Mace is the Dark Lord's superior since he was able to successfully disarm him thanks to the nature of Vopad. Secondly, not only did Luke Skywalker have some minor aid from Leia when he defeated Sidious, but the Sidious he defeated was Dark Empire Sidious, who is a bit stronger than the Revenge of the Sith Sidious Mace defeated. Lastly, and I know I said this a minute ago, but I really need to hammer this in, Kytus did not defeat Luke. Did he do well? Yes. Did he do better than most would? Yes. But the story goes out of its way to affirm that the Sith Lord and the Grand Master are not equals. As such, while Kytus' showing is more impressive on a fundamental level, when the parameters of the fights are taken into consideration, the factors generally balance out. This stalemate bleeds directly into their tactical prowess as well. Personal philosophies have little to no bearing in a fight, so I won't bother comparing them. Though, I will say that of the two, Mace is definitely the better man. Both are accomplished military commanders who have led their forces to victory on a variety of settings. While I suppose it can be argued that Windu is a better field agent while Kytus is a better armchair general, these are distinctions of insignificant difference. When it comes to just raw battle intelligence, the two are fairly on par. Mace has much more experience owing to his greater age, however Kytus has operated in wartime much longer, which I feel evens things out. As for their strategic methods in single combat, again, they're fairly equal. Both make a habit of adapting their fighting styles to suit the needs of the moment, so that cancels out. As much as I praised Windu's ability to string Sidious onto that window ledge, I don't believe such a strategy would work as effectively on Kytus since the Dark Lord has displayed such high levels of field awareness in his fights. Similarly, Dune Moke would not get Kytus anywhere with Mace. Not only is the Jedi Master far too level-headed to be undermined in such a way, but Doom Moak can only really be used at its highest effectivity when the practitioner has a deep personal understanding of the target, which wouldn't be the case here since the two have never even met. Fortunately, the chain finally breaks when we examine the combatant's martial techniques. Disregarding any sort of added attribute or weapon and focusing solely on their skills with the lightsaber, I would have to consider Mace Windu to be the more skilled duelist in the end, though he is by no means vastly superior. Darth Kytus is a beast, and against most other combatants, his raw saber skill is practically unconquerable. However, when compared to Windu, Kytus' style is simply, well, simpler. 
As nuanced as the three rings of defense are, they are not as complex as Vopad. Don't forget that Vopad was developed from Juyo, which was already considered to be the most intricate of the traditional seven forms. I know this sounds like a strange argument since anyone with even a basic understanding of combat will tell you that a simpler style can defeat a more complex one, but that only occurs in instances where there is a significant skill differential, which is not the case here. For example, if you have a duel between two beings of equal technical skill, yet one practiced Shi Cho and the other Makashi, the Makashi practitioner would win because Makashi is simply a more sophisticated form than Shi Cho. Same rules apply here. Mace Windu and Darth Kytus have equal or near equal technical skill, but Windu practices a more effective fighting style which gives him the edge. This holds true even when we factor in what I like to refer to as their special techniques. Namely, Mace's superconducting loop effect and Kytus's multi-weapon assault. While I am not of the opinion that Vopad is a be-all, end-all counter to everything Sith, I won't deny that it is one of the most effective abilities one can possibly use against them, as when used properly, it essentially gives Mace the ability to fight as long as his dark opponent can sustain themselves. Kytus may not be quite as heavily of a crazy Dark Force channeler as Darth Sidious, but he does have a tendency to lose his cool when placed under enough pressure, which would work in the Jedi's favor. That being said, Kytus is no berserker. He's actually somewhat Plagueis-like in that his fury is banked behind walls of will reinforced by an absolute belief in his own superiority over everyone around him. He does have a breaking point, but it's not an easy one to get to. As the duel progressed, Kytus would more than likely be able to recognize what Mace is doing, as feeding on the power of darkness is something he is more than familiar with, and as such would strive to keep tighter control of his emotions. However, while doing so would indeed decrease Mace's amplification, it would also prevent Kytus from bringing his full might to bear which would quite obviously pose a very risky proposition to the Dark Lord of the Sith, since he wouldn't be able to consistently repel his opponent without heavy channeling. As for Kytus' multi-weapon attack sequences, while I believe they would allow him to somewhat make up for his saber disadvantage, I don't see them as being enough to grant him victory. Mace has loads of experience dealing with foes who wield blasters and vibroblades at the same time. And while we've never seen him fight a Force-sensitive in such a way, I have very little reason to believe a Jedi of his caliber would struggle with such an encounter. The only weapons strategy I can see making a difference for Kytus would be his poison darts. And while he did kill Mara with them, that was only because she was distracted. And if other users of this device are anything to go by, it's not something high-tier combatants can't deal with. At the end of the day, while Mace Windu and Darth Kytus match each other almost perfectly in both feat scaling, tactical prowess, and raw saber technique, the Jedi Master practices a deadlier fighting style, more consistently, with special effects that enable him to counter what is essentially the Dark Lord's greatest asset. It's not much, but it's there. I award Mace Windu the edge in martial arts skill and combative strategy. One of the few remaining descendants of the revered Ghosh Windu, Mace Windu was one of the greatest force wielders to ever live. Capable of pondering and interpreting both aspects of the universal energy field with a clarity that was nearly unparalleled in his time. As mentioned previously, Mace's study and application of the force was heavily influenced by his warrior mentality. Rather than training as a garden variety peacekeeper, Windu instead developed into a peacemaker. By centering his focus strictly towards the practical needs of combat, the Jedi Master's powers were quick, clean, and awe-inspiring in their magnitude, with his peers even noting that his displays were at times almost Sith-like in their brutality. 
Windu's skill set may not have been very broad due to his relative ignorance of the higher mysteries, but what he lacked in variety, he more than made up for with efficiency. Starting with just his pure strength in the Force, numerous sources have credited Mace Windu as either the second or third most powerful Jedi of the prequel trilogy era, the only individuals exceeding him being Grandmaster Yoda, to whom the Corrin Master was frequently compared, and of course Anakin Skywalker, whose potential outshined pretty much everyone in the franchise. These comparisons were not strictly limited to the Jedi, as Darth Maul considered Mace to be a truly great warrior, Count Dooku was frequently noted to be a strong rival to him, and, as mentioned, even George Lucas himself stated that the Jedi Master was capable of standing up to Darth Sidious, which is quite the hefty power praise given that the Emperor is generally regarded as the most powerful Sith of the Rule of Two line. Shifting into his actual abilities, Windu's prowess with physical augmentation was highly prodigious, having used basic Kurado Salva techniques to re-energize his body and boost his performance level to the point where he could easily shatter super battle droids and trade blows with the massive Kar Vastor. Moving into the realm of telekinesis, Mace's aptitude was, again, second only to Yoda and kind of Anakin depending on the circumstances. Even when obviously holding back, his basic force pushes were powerful enough to shatter large stone bridges and trigger landslides large enough to sweep away multi-ton steam crawlers. Focusing more on direct combat, during the Battle of Dantooine, the Jedi Master unleashed an omnidirectional force wave that swept away an entire army of super battle droids. Three years later, he displayed an almost identical feat while working in tandem with Yoda during the Battle of Coruscant. Windu was also an apt user of Force Crush, notably caving in the chest plate of General Grievous during the aforementioned Coruscant battle. I would just like to remind everyone that Grievous's armor was specifically designed to survive starship cannons, meaning that Windu's crush was way beyond starship level. Not that that should be surprising given his scaling. A less, shall we say, messy technique in the Corrin's arsenal was Force Throw. Though Mace often reserved this skill for the manipulation of his thrown lightsaber or turning a staff into a giant cannonball, my personal favorite display was when he picked up the dismembered pieces of a super battle droid and hurled them like bullets at an incoming squad of other droids tearing them apart, as it shows both magnitude and precision. As you'd probably expect from a Jedi of his caliber, Windu was highly adept at penetrating the Force defenses of other adepts. Having casually ragdolled Jedi Master-level Quinlan Voss and Council-level Sora Bulk. While it is true that he has never been depicted penetrating the defense of Force wielders on or above his own level, there is absolutely nothing in the lore to suggest that he couldn't. Keeping with the topic of TK barriers, both Mace's passive and active defenses were top tier. He was barely phased by a blast from Sora Bulk, and much, much, much more impressively, was able to successfully parry a surprise force wave from Darth Sidious during their final battle. Now, like with the Saber argument, many have tried to classify this as an amped feat. However, the text specifically notes that Windu was not in the Vopad state of mind at the time of the attack, and therefore it could only be concluded that he relied solely on his own power, which is pretty freaking insane because, again, this is Sidious. Although I stated in my old Luke Skywalker vs. Mace Windu video that telepathy was the most underdeveloped branch of the Jedi Master's skill set, the dark side of the Force must have been clouding my mind or something because that's not even close to being the case. In reality, Mace Windu was a highly skilled telepath, and was actually renowned within the Jedi Order for his mental prowess. Like most Jedi, he could manipulate the weak-willed with the mind trick ability, and has even influenced multiple targets at a time with zero strain. Though only displayed on a few occasions, the Jedi Master possessed considerable skill with long-distance communication, which, as the name suggests, allowed him to share his thoughts across vast distances. In keeping with his Koronai heritage, Mace had a particular affinity with the animal bond's power, on one occasion actually reversing the killer instinct that had been forcibly bred into an act dog. 
Shifting over to his entries in the Power of the Jedi Sourcebook and the Clone Wars Campaign Guide, Mace is credited with Mastery of Battle Mind, which allowed him to boost his morale in fighting spirit, Farsight, which allowed for brief, if involuntary, glimpses into the future, and Empathy, which enabled him to gauge the feelings of others. His most notable credit in these sources was his immunity to fear effects and mental interference, which was actually somewhat demonstrated on Harun Kal when Kar Vaster unsuccessfully attempted to exert his will over him. Windu's mental prowess fed into his sense-based abilities. In Shatterpoint, he displayed the ability to prompt subordinates to whom he has forged a connection to through the Force into action via unspoken command. Also displayed in the book was his ability to track individuals who carry objects to which he is bonded to, like his lightsaber. Like most Jedi, he can also sense the presence and states of mind of those around him, strong in the Force or otherwise, and determine if they are conscious, injured, etc. With the exception of sufficiently powerful Force adepts who are actively trying to shield these impressions from him. Though not a committed Jedi medic, Mace has been depicted using the Force Heal ability to mend the grievous burns suffered by his former teacher Trasa following a horrific bounty hunter attack on Null. And though unconfirmed, it is my belief that this power was also instrumental in keeping him alive on Harun Kal after Deepa stabbed him through the gut. The Jedi Master has also been credited with mastery of the advanced Force Stealth, though his exact level of aptitude is unknown at this time. Moving into the more exotic territories, Mace was a master of the obscure technometry ability, which allowed him to tap into and read technological devices, and in some cases actually control them. Basically a scaled down variant of the much more well known Meku Duru technique. Though I admit this is complete speculation on my part, it is at least somewhat implied in Star Wars Republic issue 83 Hidden Enemy Part 3 that Windu might have possessed a basic understanding of Force illusions, which involved the caster projecting images into a target's mind and bending light to create astral projections of whatever they desired. Last but not least, we have Mace Windu's most well-known force power, a rare gift that only a few Jedi over the generations have ever come close to mastering, the Shatterpoint ability. This power grants Mace an acute insight into metaphysical fault lines perceived through the force, allowing the Jedi Master to see points of vulnerability, importance, or curiosity. This principle applies both in a direct sense in combat with opponents, as well as the ability to literally shatter seemingly unbreakable objects with a single tap. While this alone would make the Shatterpoint power pretty freaking OP, Mace's innate talent combined with his years of training have pushed his aptitude to the next level. In addition to perceptions in the physical realm, he could also perceive metaphysical insights. Insights like those observed within the cause and effect of given actions, the weight of a decision, the meaning of a path leading to a specific event, the importance of an individual, or even where the person in question literally breaks. All in all, I think Mace Windu himself summed it up quite well with this little passage. The sense is not sight, but see is the closest word Basic has for it. It is a perception, a feel of how what I look upon fits into the Force, and how the Force binds it to itself and to everything else. I was six or seven standard years old, well into my training in the Jedi Temple, before I realized that other students, full-grown Jedi Knights, and even wise masters could sense such connections only with difficulty and only with concentration and practice. The Force shows me strengths and weaknesses, hidden flaws and unexpected uses. It shows me vectors of stress that squeeze or stretch, tore or shear. It shows me how patterns of these vectors intersect to form the matrix of reality. Put simply, when I look at you through the Force, I can see where you break. With the blood of Darth Vader running through his veins, Darth Kytus was a master of the dark side who managed to rise above even the standards of the other Sith who comprised the Rule of Two, summoning and discerning fundamental truths of the Force in ways unlike anyone had previously or since. As I mentioned in his martial section, Kytus studied and applied his powers from a heavy spiritualistic perspective. While not quite an outright zealot, 
it wouldn't be much of a stretch to categorize him as a quote-unquote force worshipper. This mindset was further enhanced by a strong zest for learning, which pushed him to traverse practically the entire galaxy in order to study every scrap of force knowledge available to him and build up an extremely broad skill set. Addressing his raw power level, Darth Kytus was one of the strongest Sith Lords to ever live, at least one source describing him as THE most powerful of the Order. While this is an admittedly vague designation since similar claims have been made about Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis, even if we were to limit this statement to just his era, this would still put Kytus above the likes of Vion Galleon and pre-prime Darth Krait, both of whom being at least low Grand Master level in Force Connection. Shifting over to his standing compared to the Jedi, Kytus has been noted on multiple occasions to possess the same innate Force potential as his twin sister Jaina Solo, who herself was already top tier in the verse. The big comparison for the Sith Lord, however, is of course between him and Grand Master Luke Skywalker. While the story does make it clear that Kytus did not possess quite the same level of raw power as his uncle, Luke has referred to him as being, and I quote, massively powerful, and that was showcased in their fight. Plus, like with Mace and Yoda, if your ceiling is quite possibly the most powerful Jedi in existence, you're not exactly weak. Moving into his direct feats, Kytus was an expert in the field of physical augmentation, using the aforementioned Kurado Salva technique to sustain his body following traumatic injury and boost his performance level to the point where he could easily outpace council level adepts like Mara and Kyle, and even stand his ground against grand master level fighters like Jaina and Luke. As a telekinetic, Darth Kytus possessed both extreme magnitude and deadly precision. Even when in a calm state, his most basic force pushes could direct the flow of sound waves, speed up the flow of air molecules to create fire, as well as move and stabilize several tons worth of material. When engaged in combat, Kytus could become something akin to a force of nature. Though rarely shown, the Dark Lord has been noted on several occasions to have produced force waves powerful enough to blast away several starships feats made all the more impressive by the fact that it's never been implied that doing so cost him any sort of severe effort. Kytus was also a frequent user of Force Throw, turning any and all loose objects he could wrap his mind around into deadly projectiles. This ability was applicable even when faced with beings of his own power level, as demonstrated when he blindsided Luke with a hurled Vong torture device during their duel. Like most Sith, Kytus was a master of Force Choke, throttling the life of both enemies and allies alike. While most practitioners of this technique used it rather bluntly, simply closing off a target's trachea or equivalent thereof, Kytus, like his grandfather, employed it very inventively, either crushing a being's heart, or my personal favorite use, rupturing an artery in the brain in order to cause a fatal bleed. Given all this extreme power and exactness, it probably comes as a surprise to no one that the Sith Lord was highly skilled at penetrating the Force defenses of other adepts, easily blasting away Master Level Aura Singh, and even overpowering Grand Master Level Saba Sebatine and Jaina Solo. In terms of defense, Kytus possessed a strong aptitude with Force Shields even as far back as his Initiate days. While it is true that Jaina and Luke have overpowered his active barriers, considering the amount of power they wield, I think it's safe to say that only force wielders of that level are any real threat to him. Telepathy could honestly be argued to be the branch of power in which Kytus has the most versatility if not an outright specialization. Singular mind tricks were about as easy for him as blinking, and he has displayed zero issue influencing massive groups. The Sith Lord was also quite adept at long-distance communication, sometimes sending strategies across space and time to his allies, but more often than not, warnings. Though it manifested for slightly different reasons, Kytus shared Mace's strong affinity with animals, and therefore was a consummate master of animal bonds. My personal favorite display being when he plucked an image from a wild hawkbat's mind and projected it back into the creature in order to bring the image directly to the forefront of its mind. 
Speaking of targeted manipulation, one of Darth Kytus' signature telepathic powers was Memory Rub, which, as the name suggests, allowed him to either alter or outright erase the memories of a target. While such a technique would usually be ineffectual against other Force wielders, since they are all born with some degree of telepathic resistance, Kytus has actually advanced his application to the point where he could overcome this limitation, at least when wiping the mind of a young and inexperienced adept like Ben Skywalker. The Sith Lord possessed a similar degree of skill with Mind Shards, being able to freeze targets in place by attacking them with a telepathic bolt, even when they are as strong as Aura Singh. Gifted with farsight, Kytus would often receive visions of the future in the heat of battle, though it is worth noting that his ability to interpret them wasn't always the best. He has also been credited with Force Empathy, however, I think it's safe to say that he lost it after falling to the dark side, regardless of what he might preach to the contrary. Moving into a grander scale, Darth Kytus was one of the first of his generation to master the art of battle melds, which enabled him to synchronize his mind with his forceful allies to improve tactical coordination. He refined this power even further into battle mind to boost his fighting spirit, which he refined even further into the highly advanced Sith battle meditation. Also known as Sith battle coordination, the power functioned much along the same lines as regular Jedi battle meditation. However, instead of commanding his armies through subtle influences, Kytus could actively dominate them. Unsurprisingly for a being of such mental fortitude, Kytus's sense branch based abilities were off the charts. In addition to sensing the presence and intentions of beings in his direct vicinity, the Dark Lord could project his awareness across entire star systems without issue, though it is worth noting that he still couldn't locate sufficiently powerful beings who were actively trying to shield themselves from him. Speaking of concealment, Darth Kytus was also a practitioner of the Art of Small Power. Essentially the ultimate advancement of the basic force stealth technique, the Art of Small allowed the user to minimize their aura so completely that they could literally become invisible to the force. While it is debatable as to whether or not he mastered this technique to the same degree as his one-time mentor-slash-torturer Verger, it goes without saying that Kytus' application of this power was well beyond the standard, as he was able to successfully hide his presence from his master Lumaya and his aunt Mara Jade, both of whom I might add specialize in detection and concealment. Darth Kytus could be next to you, watching you. While the dark side of the Force has been noted on many occasions not to mesh well with the healing arts, Kytus was capable of mending minor injuries to himself and others, though doing so did cost him considerable effort and energy. In contrast to the ambiguity surrounding Windu's singular showing, Darth Kytus was a frequent and skilled practitioner of Force illusions, crafting everything from phantoms of loved ones to distract his enemies to more subtle applications like altering his physical appearance. The Sith Lord could also cancel out the effects of this power as well as he could invoke them, on one occasion dispelling an illusion cast by Lumaya with a single clap of his hands. His illusionary skills were bolstered even further by his mastery of Force Flash, which enabled him to damage the detection abilities of machinery by projecting a flash of energy into their visual fields. Moving into energy-based powers, Darth Kytus possessed a strong affinity with the Sith staple technique known as Force Lightning, and it served as one of his primary offensive abilities. Though the bolts he cast in his youth were often unstable due to his mental state, by the time he reached full Sith status, they were clean, stable, and decidedly lethal, on one occasion even chaining between multiple targets simultaneously. He has even developed this power to the point where he could disable a target non-lethally by shocking their nerve system, a technique he refers to as, well, Force Shock. On the defensive front, Kytus was a master of Tutaminus, having absorbed blaster fire from over 50 individuals at the same time and even dispelling blasts from several starship cannons. While it is true that the Dark Lord has never showcased the ability to deflect either Force Lightning or Lightsaber Blades with this power, I personally consider such feats to be well within the scope of his capabilities. And even if they aren't, his skills are still far from average. Up next on his vast arsenal, 
Darth Kytus was actually another of the very few Force sensitives across galactic history who could employ the Shatterpoint ability. Presumably discovered by the Dark Lord shortly before his death, Kytus proved himself a natural talent with the rare power as he was able to shatter a Mandalorian's Beskar chestplate with a single tap. Beskar, mind you, being so durable that it was pretty much lightsaber proof. That being said, it is worth noting that while Kytus has proven himself a master of shattering physical objects, he has never showcased the ability to apply this technique on a deep metaphysical level. One way in which the Sith could alter the metaphysical realm was in his use of the Sever Force ability. Having first become aware of this generally light side aligned power years ago from Verger, Kytus mastered the extremely rare Sith variant and showcased his prowess when he temporarily stripped Ben of the Force by overshadowing his cousin's Force aura with pure dark side energy. While it's never been confirmed that Kytus could strip a being's connection to the Force permanently if he desired it, I personally see no reason he couldn't, even if doing so would require considerable time and effort. As I mentioned all those years ago in his physical breakdown, Darth Kytus possessed an insane level of endurance that was fostered by his ability to mentally cut himself off from pain and feed on it to strengthen his connection to the shadows. Though it's never been stated by name, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that he manifested an instinctual application of the ability known as Crucitorn, which was developed specifically with the intent of increasing a user's combative viability by temporarily making them immune to pain. Following the devastation of the Yuuzhan Vong War, Darth Kytus, then Jason Solo, spent the next five years traversing the stars intent on learning everything about the Force he possibly could. Not only did this journey massively boost Jason's power level, but he also gained knowledge of several esoteric abilities from force-wielding organizations outside the Jedi and Sith Orders. From the Theron listeners of Nam Koryas, he learned, well, force listening, which enabled him to both understand any language and listen to beings across vast distances. From the Witches of Dathomir, he learned the Night Sister Blood Trail, which allowed him to track anyone who comes in contact with his blood, which, while active, can't be removed by normal means. From the Sages of Berendo, he learned Acute Weather Prediction, which I don't think I need to explain, as well as the much more impressive Anya Sef technique, which allowed him to suffuse his body with low-level electromagnetic radiation, which effectively made him immune to an electrocephalo scan, which, for those of you who don't know, is basically the Star Wars equivalent of a lie detector. Kytus's most notable training came under the feet of the Ang Ti monks of the Cathol Rift. From them, he learned Fighting Sight, which enhanced his precognition, as well as Fold Space, which allowed him teleportation of either objects or himself across various distances. The most notable power he gained from the monks was the highly advanced flow walking. Referred to by some fans as forced time travel, flow walking, once properly mastered, allowed the user to literally project their minds into the past and even alter it. Now, the limitations on this power are not well defined. While it is noted to be extremely difficult to learn and hard to maintain, as you can only do it in very deep meditation, it's never really been stated that there is a limit to how far a user can go back. Kytus himself has projected back as little as a few days and as far as 59 years. He wanted to see his grandfather raid the Jedi Temple. Yeah. As for the level of past alteration possible, well, Luke does state that there is a hard limit on what a user can do, and the most we've seen is when Tahiri pushed her past self into Anakin Solo's arms so they could have that kiss they never had. And honestly, I see that as being the absolute limit to what a flow walker can accomplish. Otherwise, you would think the past would be changing all the time. Last, but certainly not least, we have Darth Kytus' ultimate power, a state of being known simply as Oneness. During the final battle of the Yuuzhan Vong War, Jason Solo faced off against the secret supreme overlord Anami, and just when all seemed lost, Jason gave himself to the light side of the Force completely and utterly. No longer hindered by any sense of individualism, Jason became a literal extension of the Force's will. His body glowing with Force energy, Jason's power soared to levels unimaginable, and with less than a thought, 
he defeated Anami and brought an end to nearly half a decade of war. Sounds pretty amazing, right? Well, there's some issues. I've wanted to talk about this for a while, and I finally have an excuse, so here it is. Disregarding for the moment that Jason expressed doubt that he would ever be able to assume this state again, since that could be easily written off due to him being significantly weaker than he would later become, I am of the opinion that oneness is no longer possible for Darth Kytus to attain. This has nothing to do with Kytus specifically, as I personally believe that true oneness with the Force is actually impossible for any Sith to attain. Let me explain. Firstly, every single notable instance of oneness shown in the series has been attained by Jedi. While all of course are one in the Force, this trend by the creators does point to a possible connection between the state and followers of the light. Secondly, the only time a Sith has ever been eluded to attaining oneness was with Darth Malgus in the deceived novel after he kills Alina. My issue with this instance, though, is not only does Malgus not display any of the physical or power-based characteristics seen when the Jedi characters achieved oneness, but the statement slash claim of it came directly from Malgus's thoughts and not the text, meaning there could very well be some personal bias. Just because you think you're one with the Force doesn't mean you actually are. Another issue to consider is how the oneness state is achieved. It's always been described as a Jedi letting go of themselves completely and becoming pure conduits for the Force. No emotion, no thought, no nothing. That's really counter to how the Sith use the Force. Sith assert themselves over the Force and break it to their will. You can't really become one with something you're seeking to dominate. It literally doesn't make any sense. As such, while I agree that it might be possible for a Sith to attain something akin to oneness in a psychological sense, true oneness is impossible due to their nature, and as such, it is no longer something that Darth Kytus can attain. Though, given his power, does he really need it? It's all tied up, and since Force Abilities will be the deciding factor in this matchup, I will be proceeding directly into the final verdict. While Mace Windu and Darth Kytus were similar in that both were extremely powerful individuals who spent their lives studying both aspects of the universal energy field, they developed along almost diametrically opposing lines. Mace is a warrior who maintained a strong but not specialized spiritual understanding, whereas Kytus is a spiritualist who maintained a strong but not specialized understanding of the way of the warrior. Although I don't necessarily view either side of the coin as being inherently superior to the other, this is a contest of pure force ability, not personal fortitude, and viewed through those constraints, one approach does have a clear advantage. Starting off with just their power levels, there is absolutely no question that Darth Kytus exceeds Mace Windu in terms of raw force connection. Not only has the Dark Lord been scaled to beings on or above the Jedi Master's level, but more to the point, he has demonstrated a greater level of magnitude on a more consistent basis. However, the question then becomes, how much impact does this power gap have on the contest? To be honest, it's difficult to say. Darksiders typically display an inherently greater variety and potency of combative ability even when faced with an opponent of equal or near-equal power. Laid out purely as is, I would say the difference between Mace's strength in the Force and Kytus's is roughly equivalent to the contests they faced with Sidious and Jaina in their respective final battles. Sidious is definitely a fundamentally different Force wielder than Kytus, and Jaina has unquestioningly more raw force potential than Mace, however, the overarching power dynamics are basically the same. Kytus is more powerful than Mace, but the gap between them is not so large that the Sith Lord would just wrist flick him. I mean, for force's sake, the Jedi can blunt a wave conjured by Darth Sidious. He's not going to just fold at the first sign of his foe's power. This is especially poignant when we consider that the Vapad effect allows Windu to at least somewhat make up the difference in his and Kytus' strength by using his own dark energies against him. Sadly, even with these factors of power considered, 
there is still a rather noticeable disparity in their respective skill sets. Karadu Salva techniques feed into physical ability and martial arts training where we have already decided our verdicts. As far as telekinesis goes, again, it's complicated. While their respective levels of skill with the art are very much equal, as both can call on it at a moment's notice and employ it in a variety of unique ways against similarly powerful opponents, Darth Kytus simply commands a greater level of magnitude than Mace Windu. A perfect representation of this dynamic in the more mainstream lore being what we've seen time and again from Dooku and Yoda. Telepathic prowess is barely even a contest. While Windu is a lot more adept than I originally gave him credit for, there is no question that Kytus' sheer variety outclasses him. One can bolster himself, while the other can bolster an entire army. Granted, many of Kytus' mental abilities wouldn't affect Mace much due to his credited immunity to mental interference, However, to parry an old theory proposed by my friend Reddy4 in his deleted Yoda vs Mace Windu video, it is entirely possible that Kytus' Sith battle meditation could interfere somewhat with Windu's Vopad technique, allowing him to blunt the severity of the Jedi Master's channeling and better leverage his greater power. Sense, Concealment, Techno, and Sever-based abilities don't have much relevance on a duel that takes place on neutral ground, so I won't really be going into them. Though, credit where credit is due, Kytus does take the edge in all four. One area that the Jedi Master does come out ahead of the Sith Lord is in the healing arts. Mace may have less feats than Kytus, but the ones he does have showcase a higher natural aptitude due to his light side alignment, as well as a lesser degree of strain. Minor as it may be, this does bolster the Jedi Master's combative longevity, and even somewhat makes up for the Sith Lord's physical edge. A similar dynamic is at play with their respective skill with the Shatterpoint ability. While an application of Shatterpoint versus Shatterpoint in the physical sense would just result in an impasse, it is worth noting that Mace's abilities are far ahead of Kytus's, since, as mentioned, the Sith Lord did not develop this power to the point where he could perceive metaphysical insights. This would give the Jedi Master a better overall understanding of the scope of the Sith Lord's power, Though, given that there is no ulterior motives to this fight beyond kill the other guy, its actual level of impact is hard to determine. As far as their respective skill for energy-based force abilities goes, Kytus not only has an advantage due to the naturally strong affinity owed to his dark side alignment, but also by the simple fact that Mace can't employ these powers in any capacity whatsoever. That being said, it's not an advantage that would get the Sith Lord as far as you might think. Due to Windu's practice of Vopad, Force Lightning may serve Kytus well as a distractive tool or supplemental weapon used to keep the Jedi on his guard during the lulls and the clashes of their blades, but nothing more as the Jedi Master can redirect it. This stalemate could potentially be broken by Kytus' use of Tuta Minus if he displayed the ability to block lightsabers, but he hasn't, and I can't in good conscience say that he would, even if I think it's totally possible. Speaking of supposition, even if my assumption about Mace's abilities to conjure Force Illusions is completely accurate, he has not displayed the same level of magnitude or finesse with which Darth Kytus has used the power. Even if we assume their skills at conjuring were equal, Kytus could dispel phantoms from Lumaya, who is easily a more skilled illusionist than Windu, which means at best it's another impasse. In regards to how Kytus' esoteric abilities would influence this fight with Mace, I'm of two minds about the whole thing. On the one hand, Baron Doe Weather Prediction, Night Sister Blood Trails, the Anya Sef ability, and Flow Walking don't really have any hard combative applications. On the other hand, Crucitorn, Fighting Sight, Theron Force Listening, and Ang T Teleportation do. Crucitorn improves the Dark Lord's combative longevity and even helps to counter the effects of Force Healing a bit. Fighting Sight and Theron Force Listening massively boosts his perception to allow for greater battle awareness, and Ang T Teleportation opens up a literal world's worth of possibilities. Granted, when it comes to the teleportation specifically, we've never actually seen Kytus use it in a hard fought battle, so we don't know his strategies, but even if it's just something as simple as beaming off to the left to avoid a strike, that's still better than nothing. 
Overall, when it comes to their abilities as force wielders, the disparity between Mace Windu and Darth Kytus is basically the inverse of the conclusions we came to when comparing them as martial artists. While they match each other almost perfectly when it comes to skill, Kytus boasts both a greater level of raw power and quantity of techniques, most of which would be viable in this fight. Mace does exceed Kytus as a swordsman, but not to the same degree that Kytus exceeds him when it comes to using the Force. Add in the Dark Lord's physical advantage, and there is only one conclusion that can be reached. The battle between Mace Windu and Darth Kytus would play out in an identical fashion to the final battle between Darth Vader and the Starkiller clone on Kamino. Specifically, the version of the duel that was presented in the Force Unleashed 2 novelization by Sean Williams. While Kytus' opening salvo would initially push Mace back, the Jedi Master would not be broken, recognizing his foe's parallels with past opponents and adjusting his style to compensate. Once Mace inevitably finds his rhythm, he would take the fight directly to Kytus, feeding off his dark side power with Vopad to amp himself and slowly but surely grinding him down. However, as the fight wore on, Darth Kytus would realize that if he continued to go at the Jedi Master blade to blade, it would either be a stalemate or he would lose. Disengaging and putting some distance between them, the Dark Lord would initiate an assault with his force abilities. Windu would handle it for a time and attempt to close the distance, but the assaults would eventually take their toll. Back and forth they would go, potentially for hours at a time, the force roiling with the intensity of their clash. In the end, both would be utterly exhausted, but Kytus would be in better shape thanks to his age and durability. No longer able to sustain Vopad, Windu would be unable to defend himself from Kytus, who would take advantage of the opening and unload everything he has into one final desperate assault. In short order, Mace Windu would be blasted into oblivion, and Darth Kytus would stand, battered and bleeding, but triumphant. I declare Darth Kytus, the heir of Vader, the victor. Whew. Well guys, I hope you would enjoyed this entry in Versus Series Season 7. As always, please leave your thoughts and questions in the comments section below. I'm particularly interested to hear what you guys think of this new format and whether or not I should continue using it. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later.